We welcome Matt Klimtank to the VCAT. Yo, what is going on, everybody? Welcome to the Philly Sets of VidiCast, and uh, today I'm going to be showing my one on one interview with former Phillies general manager Matt Klimtank. Now, guys, before we get into this video, please subscribe if you have not yet. Please turn the notification bell, please like this video, comment on this video, share this video, and let's get into this. Uh, so I'd like to thank uh, Matt Klintak for taking the time to sit down uh, with me you know, so I can ask him some questions. Uh, it was a great interview, uh, asked some good questions, hope you all enjoy. Uh, so uh, here's the interview with former Phillies general manager Matt Klintak. I hope you all enjoy, here it is. Well, today we are joined by uh, former Phillies general manager, Matt Klintak. Uh, Matt, thanks so much for taking the time to come on. I really appreciate it. I'm happy to do it. Nice to see you today. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, just to kick it off, uh, we're going to talk about uh, your, your uh, you know, career uh, prior to being the GM of the uh, Phillies. Uh, so do you just want to talk about uh, you know, your time at Dartmouth, uh, you know, playing uh, college baseball, and how that transitioned into you know, being in a baseball front office? Sure, I'm happy to do it. I, um, well, I had a great experience in college, as, as a lot of kids do. Um, um, but I think the, the thing that was special for me was the relationships that, that I made, right. uh, both you know, outside, the, off the field, but also on the field. The teammates uh, that I had are, are really lifelong friends. And, and my coach at Dartmouth, Bob Whalen, is actually still the coach there many, oh, nice. many years later. So um, it's great. You know, Every couple of years, a group of us get back there and um, have a chance to go to, to catch up and, and be on campus. So um, it's great. I think uh, in terms of how it um, helped me um, get into professional baseball, um, as I mentioned, I played four years of baseball there. Um, and that certainly helps just to, you know, the, the, I think the, the longer you can play, the more you learn and uh, the better off you, you probably are. Um, unfortunately, like my goal the whole time had been to um, to play professional baseball, yeah. uh, like a lot of kids, and uh, you know, unfortunately, that wasn't in the cards for me. I wasn't mm -hmm. wasn't quite good enough. Um, but you know, during my junior year, I started thinking about you know how I might be able to uh, keep baseball in my life beyond graduation and ultimately right. make a career of it. And the truth is, this was I graduated in two thousand two, so this is before. Moneyball, the book, before Moneyball, the book, certainly before Moneyball, the movie. Right. Um, and also before Theo Epstein became a household name. And um, right. and honestly, like with the internet was kind of in its infancy. So there just wasn't as much publicly available information right. about working in front offices as there is today. Uh, it's not um, all the computers, as you were trying to say, not all the, you know, the fan graphs and all that stuff. Exactly. That came yeah. To I mean, you can, you can Google any team's directory right now and find out, you know, exactly how many people they have and what department doing what. And back in 2002, it was a little bit different than that. So anyway, after I graduated, I really um, um, set my focus on learning as much as I could about the way that teams operate and right. ultimately looking to land an entry level position. Um, and a few months after I graduated, I was fortunate to, to do so and ended up with an internship in Colorado. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. And uh, if you just want to kind of just take it from there and kind of just talk about like how that eventually led you to, you know, to be with the, uh, you know, Baltimore Orioles and with uh, former Phillies president Andy McPhail. Yeah. Um, and uh, if you just want to talk a little bit about your time as the assistant general manager of Los Angeles Angels and then eventually you being the general manager of the Phillies. Uh, so how was it to be around, you know, guys like Mike Trout and and be there, you know, when they, uh, you know, during the first season of our pool house. What was that like to, you know, be around that, that situation and, you know, be an organization during that period of time. Well, yeah. So I'll, I'll talk about the Angels experience, I guess, first, then we can backtrack. Yeah, and, absolutely. And, and, yeah. But, um, you know, my, my, the four years I spent with the Angels were uh, very exciting. My second week on the job, uh, we signed Albert Pujols and C.J. Wilson in these, oh, yeah. uh, you know, in these two massive deals in the middle of the night and <laughs> woke up the, the following morning and the baseball industry was greeted with the news that the Angels had landed these two superstars, um, Pujols especially. But... Um, and that was really the beginning of it. Um, you know, in May of that year, 2012, my first year there, uh, that's when Trout uh, came up for good. He had debuted briefly the prior year, but, uh, mm -hmm. but he came up for good in May of, of 2012. And we were witnessing history every night. I just, yeah. everything he could, he, everything he did, um, he was making leaping catches over the wall to rob home runs. He was beating out infield singles, obviously yeah. hitting for power and, and stealing bases. It was immediately... Um, he was a superstar immediately, and I remember my dad 
um, calling me one day. He, he said, this kid reminds me of Mickey Mantle. Uh, uh-huh. And, and I, he, you know, I, I wasn't around for Mickey Mantle, but right. I think a lot of people have, have since made that comparison. So, uh, yeah, it was incredible. In 2014, a couple years later, uh, the Angels won 98 games, and you know we had we had uh-huh. you know, the best record in baseball, which was right. really something special. Unfortunately, we bowed out in the first round of the playoffs that year. But um, just really can't say enough about that group out there. Uh, it was a really good core of players, right. and uh, we had a really good run. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and what was it like when you got the opportunity? I'm sure it was really exciting to you know man a baseball front office at that time, which was. You know, going through a you know, rebuild and you know, kind of saying goodbye to some of the uh, older players. And what was that like to kind of take the take the bull by the horn and you know, kind of you know, adjust yourself into a general manager position uh, after being the assistant GM of the Angels for many years? Yeah, I mean, there's, I mean, to be quite honest, it's a it's a big jump in responsibility from mm-hmm. an assistant sure. GM to a GM. That you know, every every GM has to go through that at some point, I guess. But um, but I think what what made it helpful is I had a really strong supporting cast around me. A very uh, supportive ownership group, a supportive president who had been a GM for many, many years himself, and Andy McPhail. Absolutely. Um, and we we were able to um, you know retain a lot of our folks and hire some new ones to to really build out a good front office group that many of them are still um, in key positions for the Phillies. So um, you know that those folks were were a big help. And yeah, I mean, look, I mean, I think coming into this job, coming into the the role as GM. And we tried to be as upfront as we could with the with the public about the the timeline. I mean, we as you mentioned, there were still you know some veterans whose contracts needed to to play Absolutely. themselves out, and the system needed to to produce, and right. um, and you know it was going to take some time, and it did, as you mm-hmm. know. Um, but you know, eventually we got to the point where um, you know we thought the the young the young group of players was in a position that it was worth adding to that. And that's, right. I think you, you kind of know how some of those off seasons Absolutely. followed. But um, so, but yeah, it was a, you know, we really got to experience, you know, a couple of different, uh, it, well, from the rebuild to contending years, you know, in a relatively short period of time. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and uh, not to jump ahead too too far, but, you know, signing that really just, you know, changed to save this organization, you know, pretty much forever. I mean, uh, you know, the 2018, 2019 off season, you know, with the Bryce Harper, Manny Machado, you know, back and forth, uh, pretty much all off season. Uh, you know, of course, you were general manager during that time, and you know, that was a time where you know, Phillies fans really felt you know unsettled about you know, you know, who, you know, who's going to go to Philly or Machado or Harper. You had a lot of money to spend, and I just want to talk about you know that feeling and you know how you know you know did you feel a lot of pressure from the city of Philadelphia to land one of those two guys and. Uh, what was it like to finally, you know, land, you know, Bryce Harper? You know, one of the things that uh, you're told pretty quickly upon becoming a GM in Philly is that you can't really listen to everything that's going on <laughs> in the media. Um, now, obviously, in this particular case, um, it was it was pretty uh, it was pretty well known that the Phillies were going to have a big offseason. You know, John Middleton came out early in that offseason and talked the about the stupid money comment. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, and, and and prior to signing Harper, we had we had made a, a, a series of right. you know, aggressive moves leading up to it. So it really With Segura and McCutcheon. Segura, yeah. McCutcheon, David Robertson, mm-hmm. the Romuto trade. Um, there were you know there were there were a few. So uh, by the time we reached spring training, which is when we signed Harper. Um, you know, it was no great shock to, to, the, to the industry that the Phillies yeah. were being aggressive that offseason. Um, so, look, as far as pressure was concerned, I don't think that's the right way to characterize it. I think um, I can say this now. I mean, that was easily the most exciting offseason we had. Yeah. Um, and it's fun when you're out there, you know, attached to the best players available, yeah. whether it's trades or free agency. And really, you're, you have the ability to consider – anybody and, and explore everything and, and that's that's the way we we treated it and um you know I, I, I think a lot the the actual signing of harper and how that came to fruition has been pretty well documented uh, absolutely uh, both in print and on and on, on TV. Yeah. yeah so i don't know if i have a ton to add about the, about that but um but yeah that mo- that morning you know when we when we closed it out that was uh, and really the days that followed were were about as exciting as anything that we experienced right. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I just want to touch on this a little bit. Was there, you know, like one guy that you really prefer in the offseason? Was it, you know, Manny Machado or Bryce Harper? I mean, of course, you ended up getting, you know, Harper. But was was there a preference there? Or uh, did you just kind of, you know, just take it and see where it went? Of course, there is structure in the offseason. But was there really one guy that you really preferred? You know, I, I kind of mentioned earlier about how the, the, the way that the offseason unfolded uh, put us in a position to really consider 
everything. Yeah. And we made a, you know, I, I think it was a pretty well publicized pursuit of Patrick Corbin earlier that winter. And we yep. didn't, we didn't sign him. That's mm-hmm. it's not like we achieved everything that we sought to do. But mm-hmm. um, so you know, we were in on Machado till the very end, and we were in on, mm-hmm. on Bryce till the very end. And I, you know, Manny's done very well in San Diego for through his first few years, and Bryce has obviously done very uh-huh. well here. Um, you know, I think the thing about Bryce that you know was 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 notable at the time, but has really proven uh, proven to be the case, is just what a good fit he is for this city and the, and the way baseball Absolutely. is played in this town. Um, you know, he plays with his hair on fire all the time. He's uh-huh. always saying the right thing, the intensity, and I think that is something that really resonates with the fans in Absolutely. Philadelphia. Um, and so I think from that perspective, that's been a really good fit. And obviously his on-field contributions have been a good fit as well. Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. And uh, just to kind of build off of, you know, talking about Bryce Harper, I mean, having an MVP season this year, depending on the best numbers we've seen at him since his amazing 2015 campaign, uh, do you see him taking the Most Valuable Player Award this year at the National League? <laughs> well, there's a, one, one big week to go. And, and it was sometimes uh, in, with the um, award voters – you know, kind of the what yeah. have you done for me lately factor yeah. uh, plays a key role. So obviously Bryce has been on fire really for the second half of yeah. the season. Uh, so he's been on a great uh, pace and hopefully he can continue that uh, for the next week, not only for his MVP candidacy, but also for the sake of the, right. the, the, the rest of the team and its playoff chances. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I definitely agree with you on that. Um, so uh, just moving on here to another, you know, big signing that you were able to, you know, put together. Uh, you know, it's exactly we were signing. I mean, not only, you know, at that time, I mean, that was a, you know, pretty big name starting pitcher, but we had no idea, you know, the kind of production he was going to give, you know, this Phillies team. So uh, you're really instrumental in the, that signing, of course, and, you know, as your time as general manager. Um, so you just want to talk a little bit about that, you know, taking him from the New York Mets and how, you know, good that probably felt to, you know, take him from the division rival. Not only did it work out financially, but to, you know, kind of have that sting towards that, you know, that organization a little bit. Um, but, uh, you know, did you, uh, I'm going to kind of put it this way, but, did you expect him, you know, the numbers he's putting out right now, did you expect him to have these numbers when, you know, he put that name in that contract? Um, I mean, look, I, I think, let me, let me back up and then we'll, we'll get to that. So I think in 2018, as you'll recall, um, we had our starting pitching staff took a big leap forward. Um, and guys like Pavetta and Eflin um, and obviously Nola right. and others uh, really put us in a position where we had one of the better rotations in baseball. Yeah. Um, and then in 2019, that rotation took a, a, a pretty big step backwards, as you'll, yeah. as you'll probably recall. Um, so going into that offseason, following the 2019 season, you know, one of our principal goals was to add somebody that could pair with NOLA at the front of the rotation. Um, obviously, we had to be prepared to pivot to other scenarios, which may have meant um, you know, tar- maybe the trade market or you know, lesser dollar players you know, with you know, maybe maybe multiple players for right, lesser dollar. Right. But um, going into that offseason, Zach was, um, you know, very high on our list. Absolutely. Be- partially, be- well, it- mainly because we thought that the way that his you know, season with the Mets had played out the prior year, that, you know, Zach was a good pitcher, but we thought that there might be more in the tank um, that, he- that he could tap into and, and take yet another step forward. This is a guy whose first few years in the league with the Mets were, were fairly uneven, um, in some cases through no fault of his own, you know, injuries and, and rehabs and, and things of that nature. So um, we thought there was some untapped potential in him. Right. Um, but you don't know that. You don't know that it's going to come to fruition. Yeah, exactly. um, so, you know, in, in that sense, it was, you know, there, we, we were taking on some performance risk, of course, as you are with yeah. any pitcher you signed to a five year deal. Absolutely. Um, but, you know, to credit to Zach and, and to the, the pitching coaches that he works with and his work ethic and um, that he, he really does appear to have taken that, that step forward. It, last year in the short season, but, it's, but especially this year, um, you know, he's really, he's really put forth a, a great season. So um, I think, you know, whether it's the pro scouts that were right. pushing that deal or our analysts who were, who were looking at it? There's a lot of a lot of people, lot lot of people that played a role yeah. in in, in, um, in promoting his um, status as a free agent, and obviously, you know, can never sign a player for a hundred plus million dollars yeah. without supportive ownership, yeah. um, which is which is always the case. So, you know, a lot of lot of thanks to go around on that one. But uh, I'm really happy for Zach that he's that he's done as well as he's done so far. Absolutely, um, and uh, you know, during your time as general manager, I mean, uh, you know, JT Muto was not signed to you know a contract uh, yet. Um, and it goes kind of back to the, you know, the question I asked about, you know, when the, during the 2018, 2019 free agency with, you know, Harper and Machado, 
Um, but, uh, you know, it goes back to pressure you alluded to earlier. You don't really take much pressure from the Philadelphia fans. But, of course, during that time, how much pressure did you really feel from, you know, from fans, media, you know, everybody, you know, maybe people in the organization to, you know, get a deal done to uh, JT Mimito? Yeah, I mean, again, I, this is, I've always tried to be transparent, and I, I'll just repeat right. it here. When, the day we acquired him, you know, I talked about our desire to. I called him the best catcher in baseball, and then yeah. and then talked about our desire to retain him long term. So right. it's not as though you know anybody was making up the, these stories. Yeah, yeah. I I said right. as much, and 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 I meant it, and I you know I meant it all the way through. Right. Um, you know, one of the things with JT, we, we, we made a run at signing him that first spring when he was with us um, in 19, uh-huh. um, which didn't ultimately lead to a, to, a, to a deal, but, you know, got the ball rolling. Right. And then we were making progress towards a deal in spring training uh, heading into 2020 when, of course, you know, the pandemic hit. And that yeah. messed up a lot of things, not, yeah. not, just, um, not just the negotiations with, with JT. Um, obviously, there were much bigger... Uh, implications throughout the world than just a, a, a mere contract negotiation. So yeah. really, that put us in a position where we really had no choice but to wait. And I know that that was frustrating for a lot of people. I know that you know Harper, for example, was very vocal yeah. about wanting to us to sign JT, and we wanted it too. We right. just we just had to wait um, until mm-hmm. the timing of it of made sense, and and the relationship never um, never wavered. Mm-hmm. The communication with the player or with his agent never never wavered and and obviously I was out of the GM chair um, at the time that the, the yeah. idea that he agreed but um, you know from all from all accounts it sounds like it was a very amicable um, situation and yeah. it's a it's a good fit all around so and in the end you know we yeah. got, we got our guy right absolutely um, but uh, I just you know going back to kind of just wrap up your 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 career as you know Philly Sham manager for five seasons and I think you kind of alluded to earlier with the how exciting the 2018 2019 off season was but if you had to just pick a certain moment uh, during your time as Sham manager what would you say was you, your favorite moment like the moment you felt the most excited uh, you know over that you know span of you know the five seasons yeah oh boy there's a I mean obviously upon uh, being offered the job, that's pretty. That's, oh, absolutely. that's pretty exciting. Um, I am a, as much as the um, the walk off losses are painful. Yeah. The walk off wins are so fun. So I remember the Harper walk off Grand Slam oh, against yeah. the Cubs. Yeah. I mean that was that was certainly a highlight. Um, you know the the beginning, the first half of the 2018 season when mm-hmm. we really weren't expected to, internally or externally expected to contend. And we were, you know, in first place through, you know, through much of the season into the summer. You know, I think that was that was pretty fun. Yeah. Um, we already talked about some of the the off season right. you know, trades and free agents. So, um, but if I'm being completely honest with you, I think some of the some of the memories that will be the most uh, that I'll cherish the most are are things that you know the public will never see. It's it's the relationships and the time that you spend with with the people around you and in this industry, like a lot of industries, but. We spent a lot of time, you know, at the office. We spent a lot of time on the road right. together. We spent a lot of time in spring training, and and really, it's the people that keep you going. Right. Um, so I'd have to say, you know, probably above all, it's 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 sort of the time that I spent with people, yeah. uh, working towards a common goal and, mm-hmm. and working hard, but enjoying it along right. the way as well. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so just talk about like you know current baseball a little bit. Uh, you know, there just there's been a lot of long games this year. You know, around Major League Baseball. Um, so what are your what are your takes on you know these longer games? Do you think this is hurting the game of baseball? Um, and what if you know or you know your opinion needs to change in order to you know maybe shorten up these games a little bit to try to attract some of the younger you know people to this you know game of baseball and you know try to make it more exciting again? Well, it's not just a this year thing, right? It's, we've been trending this way yeah. for, for several years, uh, absolutely. Se- several absolutely. years now. Yeah. Um, and I think you know I. I I agree with you that I, you know if, if if something's not done about it, you know we we run the risk of you know losing some fans and and ultimately the you know the game right. evolving over time. So um, I take some comfort um, in the fact that I know some really really bright people uh, are working on this um, issue, both at the league level and on the play, at the player level and the players association level. Um, obviously, there's a round of collective bargaining going on, you know, right, this, yeah, this yeah. off season, um, and oftentimes uh, changes to um, the on the on field right. game and, and the pace of play and such 
you know, those are subject to collective bargaining, any rule changes. Yeah. So, um, you know, I don't know for certain that there will be significant changes made, but I do know that we've got the right people working on it. Um, um, and hopefully over time we will get to a point where, you know, our, our players and our fans are, you know, in embracing the game for what it is. And, and if, right. if changes are needed to, to get back to that, then then um, hopefully we'll get to that. Absolutely. Uh, and I understand, yeah, of course, you, your time as a general manager of the Phillies. But uh, if you just want to talk about, uh, you know, what players, you know, around Major League Baseball, not just the Phillies, or you know, kind of changing the game a little bit. You go to, of course, he's out for the rest of the season right now. But you know, you know, Ronald Cunha Jr. guy shows a lot of emotion on the Atlanta Braves. Uh, you know, of course, a guy on the Phillies. You know, like a guy like Bryce Harper, who, well, as you said, wears his emotion on his sleeve and you know plays with fire. Uh, you want to talk about you know, guys like that? Do you think that they're you know going to be you know you know more attractive to the younger generation uh, rather than just you know the old school kind of player that you know kind of just you know goes out there and does his job you know doesn't flip the bat? Do you think the players more you know younger you know, younger players are you know more attractive to the younger generation than you know, say the you know older veteran that you know goes out there and you know it just does his job? I think right throughout the course of baseball history, you know the exciting players are the ones that are the most. Popular and also the ones that are right. probably um, you know the best at interacting with with fans, right? right? Yeah. Signing autographs and, and doing the yeah. interviews, and um, so I, I think that probably hasn't changed. But I do think what you said is correct. I do think you know Major League Baseball has a lot of really exciting young players Absolutely. to promote right now. Um, and we talked about Mike Trout earlier. Oh, yeah. It's 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 crazy that you know he Mike Trout didn't play much this year. You know he got hurt early in the right. season and and unfortunately never came back. But in his absence, you think about the young players that have not just on the Angels, where Otani obviously has stepped up, but but throughout the game, where you have players like Guerrero, uh, you mentioned Acuna, who unfortunately yeah. also got hurt, but yeah. what, what what Soto is doing, oh absolutely, what Guerrero is doing, some of Tatis. these Tatis for sure, what some oh. of these young players in their you know early to mid twenties are doing um, is really exciting, and I think just you know not not as a Phillies fan or a Phillies employee, but just as a broader baseball fan. Right. I think it's you know it's it's exciting to see such young players doing well um, at such at, you know at early uh, ages. Absolutely. Um, so uh, just to go back to the Phillies here for a second, do you see them um, you know winning this division, going against Atlanta Braves, heading into Atlanta, you know two and a half back? Do you see them uh, you know, winning this division this year? What do you well, see their chances? Well, it's at? going to be a very fun week. Yeah. Um, and I you know I I I, I think there'll be well played games. I know the pitching matchups in all three games in Atlanta. Um, you know, I think it's their, their three best and, and, and arguably our three best. Um, so it should be exciting. And look, you get in the final week of the year and you're playing for a division championship. That's what it's all about. I know Joe will have these guys ready. So let's, let's, let's hope it all works out. Yeah, absolutely. I, uh, I definitely agree with you on that. Um, so uh, just going back to the Phillies, you know, talking about this year, of course, we just talked about the, you know, the, their chances to win the NL East this year. Uh, what do you think is going, you know, you know, this is a good team that's been, flo- you know, floating around the 500 mark, you know, pretty much all season, but if anything, what do you think has gone best for this team this year, uh, as opposed to you know just a 500 team? I mean, I don't, again, I don't know that any of these are going to be uh, newsworthy, yeah. but um, obviously Bryce Harper, you know, right. performing yeah. the way he has has performed has been very exciting. Uh, you know, Gene Segura, you know, hitting close to 300 for for most of the year yeah. uh, has been great. Um, you know, we talked about Wheeler earlier and just his Cy Young candidacy and how he's taken a step forward. Um, and maybe my favorite one of all is Ranger Suarez stepping up oh, yeah. the way he yeah. has in a variety of roles. You know, he was good for us in 2019 pitching out at a pen. Um, and then yeah. obviously last year was a, you know, a kind of a lost season for him because of yeah. uh, the pandemic. But, um, but yeah. for him to step up and, and sustain it, you know, for, for most of the yeah. year has been a big shot in the arm for the, for the group. So, yeah, I mean, there's definitely been some yeah. some, some positives to highlight this right. year. And, and, and going back to Ranger Suarez, I mean, what, what did you think of him in 2018 when he made a couple starts? Did you see him as, of course, in any transition to bullpen role again and then back to the starting rotation? But did you see him as a you know like a, a starter, you know, as time with the Phils in 2018, those couple starts? I think one of the things that I've always admired about Ranger um, is how cool he is. Just, he, he just right. he's calm. He does, There's no he's never, his heart rate never seems to get up, no matter what role he's pitching in. And no matter what part of the game it is, um, I remember this is kind of a fun story. So um, I don't remember the year exactly. It's probably 2017, I would I would guess. Um, in the off season, we do a program with our prospects where we bring in you know 10 or 12 of the top guys in the system right. and invite them to Philadelphia in the winter time 
uh, for an education on what to expect when they reach the big leagues. Um, and there's a bunch of speakers that, that talk to them. There's they get some media um, practice. Um, it's a it's a it's a fun week. We often take them to a Sixers game or a Flyers game, and it, it becomes pretty fun. Anyway, one of the events that when, when Ranger was one of the prospects is we mm-hmm. took them up to the MLB Network, right. um, and they got a tour of the studio, and they got to meet Harold Reynolds, and um, they just they got to see everything. Yeah, and, full experience. Yeah. And the MLB Network studios are attached to the NHL Network studios. They're oh, they're, yeah. they're right in the same place. And so we were getting a tour of the NHL Network Studios, and kind of like how in the MLB Network Studios, there's Studio 42, the, the field where the where the broadcasters would yeah. stand. In the NHL Network, there's a, there's a yeah. rink. There's a small rink, uh-huh. um, and with a with a with a net, and there's all this equipment just sitting around. So the guys wanted to you know play play <laughs> around on this on this rink. It's not ice. It's a it's a hard surface. But um, and. Ranger is the first one to go there. He straps on all the goalie gear, and he's just standing in goal as these guys are peppering shots at him. I'm fairly certain he had never yeah, you know, before yeah. played hockey. Um, but story. just how fun he is. Um, I think that story right. kind of illustrates just how fun he is and how um, he's willing to try anything. And, you know, it shows with his performance right, on yeah. the mound. He just, he just has fun out there. And... Um, you know, I'm really again. I, you've said this about several of the players, but I'm I'm like really really happy for his successes this year because I like when good things happen to to good people, and I, yeah. I do believe Rangers are one of the good ones. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, Matt, I just like to thank you so much for taking the time. You know, once again to you know come on here and answer you know some questions, and I just want to I just really appreciate that. So thank you so much. Luke, Luke thank you for having me, and, and best of luck to you. Of course, thank you. So I'd like to thank uh, Matt Klintak for taking the time to sit down with me so we can have that conversation. Uh, it was really cool to have it be in person. Uh, my first in-person video ever, right? I mean, uh, with, a, with a guest. Uh, so this was pretty cool. A pretty unique video here uh, for Philly Sands too, right? That was, that was really, really cool. So guys, if you're watching this video, please subscribe if you have not yet. Please turn on the notification bell. Please like this video, comment on this video, share this video. Check out the social media link in the description section. At Philly Sand Stove, Instagram, TikTok, Alfred Ennis Instagram, call or text 267-225-3392. Email me, phillysandstove at gmail.com. Uh, so a day off for the fills today uh, and a hot stove outline video returning tomorrow. Uh, so uh, Phil is back in action tomorrow night, though. Wheeler and Morton, 720 the first pitch. I'll see you all tomorrow for the Philly Sand Stove hotline, which is returning. Hope you all enjoyed the Clintech interview. Thank you guys so much for watching this video. I am Luke, and I'll talk to you later. Let's go, Phil. So I'll see you guys.